the partisan here is a sure focal point because he is kept apart from such general philosophical historical genealogies and can lead us back to the reality of revolutionary development. Marx and Engels recognize that contemporary revolutionary war is no barricade war in the old style. Engels, in particular, who wrote many military treatises, always emphasized this. But he considered it possible that bourgeois democracy, with the help of universal suffrage, could create a proletarian majority in parliament, and thus, legally, could turn the bourgeois social order into a classless society. Consequently, one could say that Marx and Engels also called for a completely nonpartisan revisionism. Not so with Lenin, who recognized the inevitability of force and bloody revolutionary civil war and state war, and thus also approved of a partisan warfare as a necessary ingredient of the total revolutionary process. Lenin was the first to fully conceive of the partisan as a significant figure of national and international civil war, and he sought to transform the partisan into an effective instrument of the central Communist Party leadership. As far as I can see, this appeared for the first time in an article titled, quote, The Partisan Struggle, end quote, in the Russian periodical, The Proletarian, dated September 30th, slash October 13th, 1906. It is a clear extension of the recognition of enmity and friendship that began in his 1902 pamphlet, What is to be Done? Above all, with the turn against Peter Struve's objectivism, thereby the quote-unquote professionally revolutionary was consistently in place. Lenin's article on partisans concerns the tactics of socialist civil war and is directed against widespread social democratic opinion at the time that the goal of a proletarian revolution should arise independently as a mass movement in parliamentary countries, meaning that the direct application of force was outdated. For Lenin, partisan warfare was consistent with the methods of civil war and concerned, like everything else, a purely tactical or strategic question of the concrete situation. Partisan warfare, as Lenin said, is a, quote, inevitable form of struggle, end quote, which one utilizes without dogmatism or preconceived principles, just as one must utilize other legal or illegal, peaceful or forceful, regular or irregular means according to the situation. The goal is the communist revolution in all countries. What serves this goal is good and just. Consequently, the partisan problem is also very easy to solve. If partisans are controlled by the Communist Central Committee, they are freedom fighters and glorious heroes. If they shun this control, they are anarchistic riffraff and enemies of humanity. Lenin was a great expert on and admirer of Clausewitz. He had studied on war intensively during World War I, 1915, and in his notebooks he copied quotations in German and made comments in Russian with underscoring and exclamation marks. In this way, he created one of the most remarkable documents of world history and intellectual history. From a fundamental consideration of these quotations, marginalia, underscoring, and exclamation points, it is possible to develop the new theory of absolute war and absolute enmity that has determined the age of revolutionary war and the methods of modern Cold War. What Lenin was able to learn from Clausewitz and what he learned painstakingly was not only the famous formula of war as the continuation of politics, it was the further recognition that the distinction of friend and enemy in the age of revolution is primary and that it determines war as well as politics. For Lenin, only revolutionary war is genuine war because it arises from absolute enmity. Everything else is conventional play. Lenin stressed the distinction between war, voina, and play, igra, in a marginal note in chapter 23, book 2, quote, key to the land, unquote. Logically, this was the decisive step in the destruction of the bracketing of war between states and continental European international law that had been achieved in the 18th century. The Congress of Vienna was so successful in restoring 
the bracketing of war after the French Revolution, that it lasted into World War I. Not even Clausewitz ever imagined that it would be destroyed. By comparison with the War of Absolute Enmity, the bracketed war of classical European international law, recognizing accepted rules, is similar to a duel between cavaliers seeking satisfaction. To a communist like Lenin, inspired by absolute enmity, such a type of war must have appeared to be mere play, which he might join in if the situation demanded, but which basically he would find contemptible and ludicrous. The war of absolute enmity knows no bracketing. The consistent fulfillment of absolute enmity provides its own meaning and justification. The question is only, is there an absolute enemy, and if so, who is he? For Lenin, the answer was obvious, and the fact that he made absolute enmity serious made him superior to all other socialists and Marxists. His concrete absolute enemy was the class enemy, the bourgeois, the essential capitalist, and the social order in countries where the bourgeois capitalist was dominant. Cognizance of the enemy was the secret of Lenin's enormous effectiveness. His understanding of the partisan was based on the fact that the modern partisan had become the true irregular and, thereby, the strongest negation of the existing capitalist order. He was called to be the true executor of enmity. Today, the irregularity of the partisan consists not only in a military line, which was the case in the 18th century, when he was only a quote-unquote light troop, and not only in the pride of wearing the uniform of a regular troop, the irregularity of the class struggle challenges not only a line, but the whole structure of political and social order. This new reality was conceived with philosophical consciousness by the Russian revolutionary Lenin, and the alliance of philosophy and the partisan that he forged unleashed unexpected new and explosive forces. It caused nothing less than the destruction of the whole Eurocentric world that Napoleon had hoped to rescue, and that the Congress of Vienna had hoped to restore. The bracketing of interstate regular warfare and the overcoming of intrastate civil war had become so accepted in 18th century Europe that intelligent men of the ancient regime also could not conceive of the destruction of this type of regularity. Not even after the experiences of the French revolutions of 1789 and 1793. For such, they found only the language of a general horror and made basically incongruous, childish comparisons. A great and courageous thinker of the ancient regime, Joseph de Maistre, had foreseen brilliantly what was at stake. In a letter written in the summer of 1811, he declared that Russia was ripe for revolution, yet hoped that it would be, as he put it, a natural revolution, not an enlightened European revolution like the French. What he feared most was an academic Pugachev. Thus, he took pains to make clear what he considered to be the real danger, namely an alliance of philosophy with the elemental forces of an insurrection. Who was Pugachev? He was the leader of a peasant and Cossack rebellion against Catherine II, who put a price on his head. He was executed in 1775. An academic Pugachev would be a Russian who, quote, started a European-style revolution, unquote. That would produce a series of horrible wars, and if they went too far, quote, I would not have the words to tell you what one would then have to fear, unquote. The vision of smart aristocrats is astounding, as much as in what they saw, namely the possibility and danger of an alliance of Western intellect and Russian rebellion, as in what they did not see. With their timely and orderly dates, St. Petersburg in the summer of 1811, they found themselves to be in the closest proximity to the Prussian army reformers. Yet, given their own nearness to the reform-minded professional officers of the Prussian general staff, they did not notice the intensive contacts that these officers still maintained with the imperial court in St. Petersburg. They knew nothing of Scharnhorst, Neisnau, and Clausewitz, and they failed to see the fatal flaw in linking their names with Pugachev. The profundity of a significant vision was lost, and what remained was Bonmot, repartee, in the style of Voltaire or even 
Antoine de Rivarol. If one still thinks in terms of the alliance between Hegel's philosophy of history and unchained mass forces, such as the Marxist professional revolutionary Lenin forged, then the formulation of the brilliant maestre would shrink to a small verbal effect in rooms or anterooms of the ancient regime. The language and conceptual world of bracketed war and prescribed enmity no longer were any match for absolute enmity. From Lenin to Mao Zedong In the assessment of experts during World War II, Russian partisans diverted approximately 20 German divisions, thereby contributing essentially to the war's outcome. In his book on the Great Fatherland War, 1941 through 45, the official Soviet historiographer Boris Semenovich Telpovzhitsky describes the glorious partisans who wreaked havoc behind enemy lines. In the enormous spaces of Russia, with seemingly endless fronts thousands of kilometers long, every division in the German war effort was irreplaceable. Stalin's fundamental concept of partisans was that they must fight behind enemy lines, consistent with the maxim, in the rear, partisans, at the front, fraternization. Stalin succeeded in linking the strong potential of national and homeland resistance, the essentially defensive, telluric power of patriotic self-defense against the foreign invader, with the aggressivity of the international communist world revolution. The linking of these two heterogeneous movements dominates contemporary partisan warfare around the world. Consequently, until now, a communist element has been in the forefront with its goal-oriented policy and its dependence on Moscow or Peking. The Polish partisans, who during World War II fought against the Germans, were sacrificed by Stalin in a gruesome way. The partisan struggle in Yugoslavia, 1941-45, through 45, was not only a common national defense against the foreign invader, but also a very brutal internal struggle between communist and monarchist partisans. In this fraternal struggle, the Communist Party leader Tito, with the help of Stalin and England, conquered and destroyed his internal Yugoslav enemy, namely General Draza Mihailović, who originally had been supported by England. The greatest practitioner of contemporary revolutionary war became as well its most famous theoretician, Mao Zedong. Some of his writings are, quote, today required reading at Western War Colleges, and quote, Hans Henley. Since 1927, he had assembled experiences in communist actions and then used the 1932 Japanese invasion to develop systematically all modern methods of national and international civil war. The quote-unquote long march from southern China to the Mongol border began in November 1934. It covered approximately 12,000 kilometers and suffered enormous casualties. But it constituted a series of partisan achievements and experiences that culminated in the Chinese Communist Party becoming a peasant and soldier party with partisans at the core. It is a significant coincidence that Mao completed his most important writings in 1936 through 38, i.e. the same years in which Spain defended itself against the War of National Liberation sponsored by the international communist movement. But in the Spanish Civil War, partisans played no significant role, whereas Mao credited the victory over his national opponent, Chiang Kai-shek, totally to the experiences of the Chinese Partisan War against the Japanese and the Kuomintang. For our time, Mao's most important formulations are found in a 1938 work titled, quote, Problems of Strategy in Guerrilla War Against Japan, unquote. Yet, other of his writings also must be mentioned in order to make this new Clausewitzian theory of war completely understandable. In fact, this theory of war is a consistent and systematic continuation of Prussian general staff officers' concepts. Clausewitz, the contemporary of Napoleon I, could not have conceived of the degree of totality that today is obvious in the Revolutionary War of the Chinese Communists. The characteristic picture Mao provides is found in the following comparison, quote, In our war, the armed people and the small partisan war on one side, and the Red Army on the other, is comparable to the two arms of a man, or to put it more practically, the morale of the people is the morale of the nation in arms. For this reason, 
the enemy is afraid. End quote. The quote-unquote nation in arms, as is well known, this was also the slogan of the professional officers of the Prussian general staff who organized the war against Napoleon. Clausewitz was one of them. We have seen that the strong national energies of a particular educational level of the regular army already had been garnered at that time. Also, the most radical contemporary military thinkers also distinguished between war and peace and considered war to be a clearly separate state of exception from peace. As a professional officer of a regular army, Clausewitz could not think through the logic of the partisan as systematically as could professional revolutionaries like Lenin and Mao. However, with Mao, there is still a concrete factor with reference to the partisan, whereby he came closer than Lenin to the core of the matter, which made it possible for him to think the partisan through to the end. In short, Mao's revolution was more tellurically based than was Lenin's. There are great differences between the Bolshevik avant-garde, which seized power in Russia under Lenin's leadership in October 1917, and the Chinese communists, who in 1949 won in China after more than 20 years of war. Differences in their internal organizational structure as well as in their relation to the land and the people they conquered. In view of the enormous re reality determined by a Telluric partisan, the ideological controversy concerning whether Mao taught a true Marxism or Leninism becomes as secondary as the question of whether old Chinese philosophers also made remarks similar to those of Mao. This question deals with a concrete quote-unquote red elite characterized by the Partican struggle. Most essential, as Ruth Fisher has formulated so clearly, is that the Russian Bolsheviks of 1917, from a national standpoint, were a minority, quote, led by a group of theoreticians whose majority were emigres, end quote. In 1949, the Chinese communists under Mao and his friends had struggled for two decades on their own national soil with a national opponent, the Kuomintang, in an enormous partisan war. It may have been that their provenance was the urban proletariat similar to the Russian Bolsheviks who hailed from St. Petersburg and Moscow, but once the Chinese communists came to power, they brought with them the characteristic experiences of the most difficult defeats together with the organizational competence, quote, to plant their core principles in a peasant milieu and there to develop them further in a new and unforeseen way, unquote. Here lies the deepest origin of the quote-unquote ideological differences between Soviet Russia communism and Chinese communism. But it also can be traced to an inner contradiction in the situation of Mao, who linked a universal, absolute, global enemy lacking any territorial space, the Marxist class enemy, with a territorially limited, real enemy of the Chinese Asiatic offensive against capitalist colonialism. It is the antithesis of one world, i.e. a political unity of the earth and its humanity, and a plurality of Grausraumen, large spatial political spheres, which are rationally balanced internally and in relation to one another. In a poem titled Kun Lun, Mao depicted the pluralistic image of a new nomos of the earth. If I could stand above the heavens, I would draw my sword, and cut you in three parts, one piece for Europe, one piece for America, one piece left for China, then peace would rule the world. In the concrete situation, Mao encountered various types of enmity, which intensified into absolute enmity, racial enmity against the white colonial exploiter, class enmity against the capitalist bourgeois national enmity against the Japanese intruder, and the growing enmity against his own national brothers in long, bitter civil wars. All of this did not paralyze or relativize enmity, as one might have thought, but rather intensified and strengthened it in a concrete situation. During World War II, Stalin successfully linked the Telluric partisan to the national homeland with the class enmity of international communism. In this respect, Mao was many years ahead of Stalin. Also, 
In his theoretical consciousness, Mao took the formula of war as the continuation of politics even further than did Lenin. 